thanks to Brilliant, the website and app designed to supplement classroom learning for sponsoring this video. In World War II, American soldiers fended off attacks by insects using a novel weapon, the bug bomb. This was a pressurised steel can that contained an insect repellent. When opened, the repellent would spray over a wide area, pushed out of the can by a propellant. This design caught on, and soon aerosol spray cans were being used for paint, deodorant, hairspray, you name it. And the propellant in these cans was typically something called Freon, which was an example of a refrigerant. You actually find it in refrigerators as well. Chemically, it's what's known as a chlorofluorocarbon, or CFC, which was this marvel of modern chemistry that had a wide variety of uses. However, it was eventually realised that these wonder molecules were actually unintentional destroying a section of the Earth's atmosphere, the ozone layer. Ozone, or O3, naturally forms in the Earth's middle atmosphere due to sunlight splitting apart oxygen molecules, forming a particularly dense layer around 25 kilometers above the surface that we call the ozone layer, but it's a pretty fuzzy, ill-defined layer. It's significant because ozone is extremely effective at absorbing ultraviolet radiation. You know, the kind that causes skin cancer, and for life to generally have a not fun time. Ozone provides a protective force field around the planet, reducing the intensity of UV radiation at the surface by a factor of approximately 350 million. Or I should say it did because it was discovered in the 1970s that CFCs in aerosol cans and refrigerators destroyed atmospheric ozone, to the extent that an area of particularly low ozone concentration was detected over the South Pole in the Southern Hemisphere spring that became known as the hole in the ozone layer. This hole, and the entire layer really, varies a lot year by year depending on how air is moving around in the stratosphere, and potentially also what the sun is doing. And the hole closed and reopened every year, but over the years it became apparent that its maximum extent was getting bigger and bigger. If this was allowed to continue, then there was a chance that the Earth would lose its force field against UV radiation. If that happened, it would mean a lot more people getting things like skin cancer and a whole range of other effects that we'd really rather avoid. So the international community listened to the scientists, heeded their warning, and rapidly implemented an international agreement that curbed the problem before it got too bad. Wait, what? This, this literally never happens. In 1987, the Montreal Protocol was signed, gradually phasing out the use of CFCs. And this protocol really worked. Emissions of CFCs plummeted, concentrations of CFCs in the atmosphere peaked and then fell, and the concentration of ozone in the atmosphere has been gradually recovering, and the hole closing, with year-to-year -year variability. It's expected that by the mid-21st century, the ozone layer will have basically healed. Former Secretary General of the United Nations Kofi Annan described the protocol as perhaps the single most successful international agreement to date. With it, we avoided the nightmare scenario of the Earth's surface being flooded by ultraviolet radiation. But perhaps that's not all we avoided. Before I get to that point though, let me just ask the question, why can't we do this with climate change? If we have an international agreement that clearly worked at curbing emissions of CFCs, why can't we just get a new agreement that does the same thing for greenhouse gases, like CO2? Well, for one thing, we actually have. The protocol's been amended several times since it was signed, most recently in 2016 with the Kigali Amendment. That extended the ban on CFCs under the protocol to a related family of chemicals called hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, that are also used as refrigerants. They don't destroy ozone, but they are extremely potent greenhouse gases. So the international community figured that we had this protocol that really effectively banned a similar kind of chemical for the same purpose, so let's just extend the remit of the protocol a bit. In fact, you could argue that with the Kigali Amendment, the Montreal Protocol has kind of become the most effective piece of legislation to curb greenhouse gas emissions to date, but that's not what this video is about. The problem with limiting greenhouse gas emissions in general is that they're inherent to the way we live our lives. Every time we make electricity or drive a car or grow food, we produce greenhouse gases. CFCs were used in quite limited applications with alternate propellants and refrigerants available, so they could be legislated and eventually banned really quite easily. The longer we keep emitting large quantities of greenhouse gases, however, the worse our future
nature looks, and the sooner we run into the really bad potential effects like widespread extreme weather events, drought, famine, and mass extinctions of species. But it turns out that the Montreal Protocol might have bought us some time in this. Because for a while now, scientists have been asking the question, what if we never signed the Montreal Protocol? What if we kept emitting CFCs? And imagine the world that we avoided by taking action. It's estimated that without the protocol, the Earth's ozone layer would have completely collapsed by the mid-21st century, resulting in the surface being flooded with UV radiation. This avoided future has been examined from a health perspective. It's found that we will have avoided tens of millions of deaths from skin cancer by the end of the 21st century by passing the protocol. But with more relevance to our story, it's also been examined from a climate change perspective. Because as well as destroying ozone, CFCs are also very potent greenhouse gases, trapping heat in the Earth's lower atmosphere far more effectively than CO2 or methane. And so by limiting the emission of CFCs, we've prevented some warming taking place, potentially three or four degrees of warming by the end of the century. But that's just the direct insulating effect of those gases. In a new paper this year, an additional impact has been examined, and it's a big one. How would the world's biosphere, meaning all life on Earth, forests, algae, animals, everything, have responded to all that extra UV? Young et al. 2021, published in Nature, compares a realistic, but maybe a little pessimistic, projection of the Earth's climate, RCP6, with that same projection, but with continuing, rising CFC emissions, as if we'd never passed the Montreal Protocol. These were referred to as the world projected and the world avoided scenarios, respectively. They found that, as in previous studies, the ozone layer collapsed midway through the century in the world avoided scenario. But crucially, they then examined how much extra UV was reaching the surface and, based on a meta-analysis of several previous studies, modelled how the biosphere would react in the world avoided. I'm simplifying here, but they effectively assumed that for each 10% increase in UV reaching the surface, plant life became 3% less efficient at sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. This is because when plants are irradiated by UV radiation, photosynthesis becomes less efficient. The result of this was shocking. The world's biosphere saw a precipitous drop in how much carbon it was removing from the atmosphere. By the year 2100 in the world avoided scenario, there was between 325 and 690 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere that would otherwise have been in the biosphere. That corresponds to the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere being between 115 and 235 parts per million higher. In other words, by passing the Montreal Protocol, we avoided a potential nightmare scenario in which the Earth's surface was flooded by UV radiation and, via a feedback in the biosphere, atmospheric CO2 concentrations by the end of the century would be as high as 900 parts per million. More than double what they are now. And that would be accompanied by a lot of warming, perhaps 6 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, though there'd be further warming after that. Compare that to the 3 degrees Celsius under the world projected scenario. By passing the Montreal Protocol, this paper claims, we unintentionally avoided a catastrophe in the biosphere, where it was flooded by UV and became far less effective as a carbon sink. Of course, this paper has limitations. It makes assumptions about how CFC emissions would continue to rise and how plants would respond to extremely high concentrations of UV light. But these assumptions are in line with other papers in the field, and they're based on the best data that we have available. Regardless, this is still a useful piece of work as, to quote the authors, an order of magnitude estimate of the effect of the Montreal Protocol on the ozone, UV, biosphere, carbon cycle, climate system. It's almost as if everything's interconnected. Something that I'd like to stress though is that just because we passed the Montreal Protocol doesn't mean that we fixed climate change. If we hadn't passed it, then we might have been running into some really bad stuff in the next decade or two. Whereas as it stands, we're still going to run into that stuff, but in the second half of this century. The protocol basically bought us some time, but not much of it. And now we have to use that time to bring down our greenhouse gas emissions. The Montreal Protocol shows us that it can be done. We have precedent for an international environmental agreement that works. In fact, though legislators at the time could never have known, it really worked and helped the planet and the climate avoid a real catastrophe.
Sunlight is filtered through the Earth's atmosphere before it reaches the surface. As we've seen, that's partly accomplished by ozone absorbing UV radiation. But there are other gases at play, notably water vapour and carbon dioxide, as we see in this figure. If sunlight is mostly between 400 and 2400 nanometers in wavelength, what proportion of sunlight incident on the Earth do you think reaches the surface? This is an example problem from Brilliant, who have kindly sponsored this video. Brilliant is an educational website and app designed to complement classroom learning and provide a fun, interactive learning experience for students and professionals alike. Just as we saw in this trial problem, the emphasis is put on problem solving, not rote learning, and many of their expertly written modules feature interactive puzzles. This one was on solar energy, but there are others across maths, science and computer science, including learning Python, computational biology and linear algebra to name just a few. Brilliant is available on its website, but also as a mobile app, making it perfect for spending a few minutes a day on your commute, or on your sofa, improving your understanding and sharpening your problem solving skills. I've said it several times, but I'll say it again, I wish Brilliant had been around when I was a student, because it's a perfect complementary resource to classroom or lecture hall learning. You improve your understanding so much by looking at the same topic from multiple angles, from multiple sources, and that's exactly what Brilliant allows you to do. Do. You can get yourself access to all this and more by going to brilliant.org slash Simon Clark, linked in the description, and the first 200 people to do so will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. Doing so, you support this channel and your own learning. That's brilliant.org slash Simon Clark. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really hope that you enjoyed this one. It's the second in a series that I hope will be ongoing where I take new papers in atmospheric science and basically try to translate them for a YouTube audience. If you did enjoy this video, then you can watch the first one in this series over here. And you can also pop the video a like. And if you think that other people might enjoy it, then maybe you should share it with them. If you're new here, please do also subscribe and get notified about all my new videos. And that just leaves me to say thank you again for watching and I'll see you in the next one.